Ladies and gentlemen, you are very welcome to this session of the CBA 14 for local led action toward monitoring evaluation and learning that supports local agency in adaptation. And uh, this session is co hosted by uh, World Resources Institute, represented by Tamara, and myself, David Nfitumokiza from. Uh, representing least developed countries consortium on climate change. Maybe we may want to introduce ourselves. Tamara, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Tamara Kojer from uh, WRI. I work in our climate resilience practice, and I also um, co-lead the locally led action track of the Global Commission on Adaptation along with David and other colleagues. And um, yeah, looking forward to having this conversation with everyone. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you, Tamara. And uh, along the way, we are um, a couple of our colleagues co-hosting this session that will be introduced to you when we get to part of this session uh, that uh, is, will be dealing with breakout sessions. So they'll be on their way, including Barry, Robbie, uh, Alex, and then others, uh, and the rest of the team who are behind the scenes. So let's begin with the goals of the session. Uh, the goals for our session. The first goal is uh, to provide feedback on preliminary findings and recommendations on how monitoring evaluation and learning can support locally led adaptation for a forthcoming Global Commission adaptation publication. Uh, I will, in the next slide, I'll quickly talk about uh, the Global Commission adaptation. So essentially, the first goal is to get feedback on the work uh, that's uh, being undertaken by the commission to come up with the, uh, that paper, uh, which we'll look at a little bit more later. And then uh, we also uh, ha we'll have to discuss how we can encourage uptake of recommendations coming out uh, from, the, from the paper that's being worked on so that um, we can be able to realize improved monitoring evaluation learning for local led adaptation uh, moving forward. So I talked about this being part of the work for the Global Commission on Adaptation. Um, those of you may not be very familiar with the Global Commission on Adaptation. Global Commission on Adaptation was um, uh, initiated in 2018 and uh, the, essentially the main purpose of the commission is to accelerate uh, adaptation at global level, including by elevating um, the visibility of adaptation at political level, but with much more focus on uh, concrete adaptation solutions. So uh, the commission um, is structured in two, two phases. Uh, phase one, involved, which was uh, between 2018 and 2019, when a report was, um, uh, was commissioned, the essentially that first year involved in doing an analysis to understand what's happening on adaptation and uh, coming up with uh, three specific revolutions. And uh, those revolutions are uh, included in the report. Those of you may have, may, may have seen it and those who may not have may, may reach us and then we share with you the report. And then that part of the commission's work involved building a coalition of actors who are involved in adaptation so that together uh, through a coalition of very many actors, we can be able to work together to realize the goals of the commission, but not only for the commission, which is for two years, but to move forward with the work that has been initiated and is being initiated by the commission. So the second phase uh, works and is based on the recommendations of the report, where, um, and that is called the year of action. And that year of action is just moves from the time the report was commissioned in October 2019, uh, 2019, during the climate summit in New York, uh, to December 2020, and um, so that, well, like I've mentioned, the report commissioned a number of action tracks that are seen the next slide, and um, these action tracks, the eight action tracks, those are the action tracks: one on food security and rural livelihoods, cities, finance, preventing disasters nature-based solutions, infrastructure, water. And then this work and this session is specifically focused on locally led adaptation. And the goal of the locally led adaptation 
focuses on the broader adaptation process, but the focus of this action track is much more on sparring the various um, adaptation um, funders and intermediaries involved in adaptation financing to increase the volume, the quality and the quantity of adaptation resources reaching the lowest level and uh, in a way that definitely supports devolved adaptation, action, and financing. So essentially, the focus of this session is contributing to that, um, to that action track, like I've said, which is one of the recommendations uh, with the concrete actions that the commission has been able to recommend and for the work that is ongoing. So um, the, in terms of local-led action track, as we have on the next slide, Essentially, um, the local led action track, like I've said, is involved a number of things. Some of those, uh, like I mentioned, are focused on increasing the volume and the quality and the quantity of uh, adaptation financing that's reaching local level. And uh, it has many actions, but the focus for the purpose of this session, the focus uh, will talk about two uh, aspects which are all around developing mechanisms, mechanisms to support local led adaptation. So in regards to this specific session, the key things to note is that uh, the action track is involved in the work to raise global ambition and establish fundamental and foundational principles for local led adaptation. And uh, like Tamara will present later, a set of principles to guide effective and equitable adaptation and raise global ambition and priority for local data adaptation uh, is in progress is being developed. And uh, a number of actors, um, about 30 institutions, uh, actively involved in that kind of work and over a hundred individuals are involved in the process of developing such a pieces of work. And uh, with that, we hope to develop an alliance of champions who will be able to endorse these principles so that they can come to support advocacy, accountability, and learning for local led adaptation beyond the year of action. Like I mentioned, the process of developing and building a coalition of actors is to move beyond the two years of, uh, of the commission. So within that, uh, the other piece of work that's ongoing is improving monitoring, evaluation, and learning to enable local led adaptation, which is the real heart of this session. So um, currently there's a paper, or I would call it a report that is being developed, and um, there are recommendations coming up that we shall see and discuss, um, and uh, with the focus on trying to see how the, the approaches coming out can be able to support donors and intermediary institutions and male practitioners to implement and support local led adaptation. We hope that this advancement in monitoring and evaluation learning that are going to be advanced through part of the work that we're going to do through this session, this session will be able to contribute more effective and equitable adaptation outcomes. So with that said, our agenda for the session uh, is going to include uh, the presentation of preliminary findings from the paper, from the ongoing work, and uh, that will be done by Tamara. It just take 10 minutes to talk about what's coming out from the work that has been done so far. And then later, after that presentation, we'll go into smaller groups. They'll have five small, uh, small groups, uh, four small groups. And then uh, after those small groups, we'll take 45 minutes, we'll have a report out session uh, through which we'll be able to converge and try to reflect on what will have transpired in the small groups. So um, I'll hand over to Tamara. I very much look forward to, to our deliberations through the discussions. And thank you very much. Um, we are very glad that you've joined us once again. Thank you, over to you, Tamara. Great, thanks so much, David. Um, so before I dive into talking about some of the highlights from our draft working paper, which is focused on monitoring evaluation learning for locally led adaptation, I just wanted to briefly um, review these principles for locally led adaptation that David introduced. Um, so these are principles that are being co-developed under our action track um, with IIED, 
WRI, the Global Center on Adaptation, ECAD, and, and many other partners. Um, and essentially, these principles are meant to serve as foundational guidance to support and enable locally led adaptation. Um, so while this session isn't focused on these, some of you may have seen or, or attended a, a consultation that we had earlier today as part of CBA on these principles, we did want to, um, to, to review them just briefly because they have implications for MEL and, and serve as a basis for how we have been analyzing how MEL can support locally led adaptation. So the work we're doing is, in, is intended to essentially support implementation of these principles through MEL and, and we're seeking to understand how MEL can either support or discourage locally led adaptation and, and what are specific practices, approaches, and examples of how monitoring evaluation and learning aligns with these principles. So some examples of that just to provide a, a brief sense are you know, an emphasis on learning as part of supporting this principle on flexible programming and being able to mitigate the risks that may be associated with flexible programming. Um, another is this principle on devolution of decision making, principle one, you know, how that applies to MEL and decentralizing the decisions that are involved in the MEL cycle. Um, another example is just the role of MEL to support transparency and accountability to the local level by capturing information and, and, um, and what knowledge and information is captured through the MEL cycle. So that's uh, just a quick um, grounding there on the principles. Um, but to move on to the next slide, which just provides a very brief overview of the purpose of, of this work in this paper, we're reviewing opportunities and challenges in MEL for locally led adaptation um, based on a review of existing MEL practices and concrete examples from adaptation MEL, which, which many of us are familiar with, and also MEL that's not necessarily focused on adaptation, but is looking at um, community involvement and the role of MEL as a, a social undertaking, how power dynamics may influence the MEL cycle. So kind of bringing those two areas of work together and um, really focusing on concrete examples, which I won't have time to, to go through now, but um, just to flag that we are trying to build on, on really concretely what this looks like in practice and have this be a, a practical piece of work. Um, and so, you know, if, if folks on the call have examples that they think are relevant, um, we will be all ears and, and we'd love to hear about those. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a very brief summary of the preliminary findings and conclusions that we have from our um, our research and, and other consultations that we've been doing over the past couple months. Um, and just an emphasis on preliminary, this is a draft, so these may change, um, but wanted, hopefully this provides enough of a sense for everyone to provide some feedback and, and work off of. Um, so essentially what we found is that MEL offers a lot of potential to support locally led adaptation, but these practices that align with principles of locally led adaptation are often represent a pretty significant shift from conventional MEL that may be more focused on reporting and upward accountability. And as such, that does come with, with challenges and with limitations in terms of um, additional investments of time and resources and, and just what it takes to kind of change practice. So we do really recognize that, um, that what we're talking about is, is different and, and that there are challenges and limitations to some of these practices. Um, we also recognize that while this is a nascent field and, and there's a lot more work to be done and, and research to be done as, as the field of locally led adaptation itself evolves, um, there are many, many practices and tools and technologies out there that are accessible and available that, that can help support this shift, that, that can align and help support locally led adaptation through the mouse cycle. Um, and we also talk about just recognizing that MEL isn't a neutral process because it involves decision making, it involves use of knowledge, it involves sort of defining um, what resilience looks like, that it can either help build social capital or, or it can sort of um, reflect existing uh, inequities. Next slide, please. So based on this research um, and these, these initial conclusions we have currently, we have uh, 11 preliminary recommendations um, that we have. And these are oriented more towards 
those who are involved currently in driving um, the MEL cycle and design of MEL systems, so MEL practitioners, funders, intermediary organizations, but we do hope that they will have broader relevance, um, especially as, as more actors are getting involved in MEL. Um, so I'm gonna quickly <laughs> run through these, apologies for having to, to speed through, but we wanna make sure that we leave enough time um, for discussion. So um, sort of building on, on these principles of locally led adaptation, we're encouraging local agency throughout the MEL process and, and some ways to do that include um, hiring local MEL experts and, and having balance on MEL teams, ensuring that local actors have um, a say in decisions about theories of change, about um, learning goals and processes for learning, as well as metrics and indicators. Um, the second one is, is about understanding how structural inequalities may influence the MEL process. So, you know, who, thinking about whose objectives MEL serves and, and our different definitions of resilience and different types of knowledge equally valued. We talk about balancing accountability and learning. Um, oftentimes, as we all know, there can be tensions between these two processes, but um, we, we take the stance that these can be balanced and, and one way to do this may be having distinct processes for learning and for accountability. An example of, of, an, of a recommendation that may require more resources, but, um, but does support the learning that is so important for locally led adaptation. Um, another is, is thinking about how MEL creates value for local participants. We talk a lot about um, thinking, thinking crucially about this and if we're asking for resources and time and, and knowledge from the local level, that, that MEL is, is also creating value at the local level. Next slide, please. We talk about um, enlisting appropriate methods to understand complexity and uncertainty, which is, as we all know, just sort of a, something that we all have to navigate in adaptation interventions, both in terms of bringing the climate information to inform rigorous understanding of climate risk and vulnerability at the local level, but also making sure that those involved in, in designing the MEL um, the MEL system have a, have a strong understanding, robust understanding of local context. We talk about um, indicator frameworks and adaptation metrics um, and some specific recommendations that we have are considering um, using adaptive capacity as a, as a foundation to inform indicators. Uh, we talk about integrating social, economic, and environmental dimensions into indicator frameworks since these are all recognize the interconnectedness of these, these systems um, for adaptation and of course just how um, metrics and indicators can reflect what is viewed as, as sort of um, definitions of vulnerability and resilience at the, at the local level. Um, we encourage taking a uh, demand-driven approach to building capacity and bringing in external knowledge which will inevitably be part of these processes that are making sure that those are uh, demand driven. Um, next slide. Um, and then um, collaborating with knowledge brokers is, is one approach um, that we discuss as um, an opportunity to help enable ownership and contribution of local partners and, and um, navigate some of those cultural or terminology differences. Um, we talk about leveraging technologies and process innovations to increase local ownership. Recognizing that technology is not a silver bullet in this context, but that, but that it can help and that um, mobile applications, remote monitoring systems, digital advisory services and other technologies can be used to increase access to climate information and, and inform decision making and also facilitate locally driven data collection and, and governance platforms. Um, encouraging adaptive management, experimentation and learning from failure is, is really critical um, in, in this context. And this is sort of a more of a cultural shift that we're recommending for Mel in, in terms of, and something that, that as many of you are familiar with is is growing in, in the MEL field, but recognizing um, and sort of um, the importance of learning from failure 
in order to be able to course correct and sort of embracing, embracing that. And then last but not least, um, it's just encouraging that, that learning, we encourage learning throughout the cycle, but that it's also applied and, and documented and shared both horizontally at the local level and across sectors, but also vertically so that we're sort of learning is coming full cycle to inform future adaptation interventions. Um, and we also talk about leveraging platforms like this, like CBA, like Gobeshna, like COT, some of the global platforms that we have to share learning and inform sort of the evidence base that we have around locally led adaptation. Whew. So those are our <laughs> recommendations. And just a quick snapshot of, of sort of what's come out of our research so far, but that we really um, are looking for, for more feedback on and, and keen to get your thoughts on. So next slide, please. Um, so with that, um, I guess before we, the next step is we're gonna, we're gonna quickly pivot to um, breakout discussions, but I did wanna pause briefly in case any of my colleagues have anything to add or in case there are any clarification questions. We'll have time for discussion and questions at the end or, or through the breakout groups, but in case there's anything that, that needs to be clarified before we dive into breakout groups. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm glad that my <laughs> speedy overview <laughs> was relatively clear. Um, so here are some discussion questions that, that came from some of the gaps that we actually have um, that we're looking to fill and, and things, issues that we think are particularly important to make sure that are covered in this final publication. Um, my colleagues, David and Robbie and Barry are gonna help facilitate these breakout groups um, and we want to make sure that we cover all the questions. So we're going to just have each group start with a different question. Hopefully the 45 minutes will be enough to cover all our bases, but just to make sure we don't get tons of feedback on one question and uh, not enough on others. Um, Robbie's group, group one, is going to start with question number one on incentivizing changes in practice. David's group, group two, is going to start with this question on knowledge and information, uh, number two. Um, my group, group three, is gonna start with a question on integrating gender equity, and Barry's group four is gonna focus on um, mutual accountability and learning. And then one last point before we break into discussion, I think this is the last one, and hopefully folks are familiar with, with breakout groups um, by this point in the conference, is um, just and one, just to encourage open discussion. We hope everyone feels free to contribute your ideas. All ideas are welcome. You know, we really want to hear your feedback, so please don't be shy. Um, and we hope that we can have sort of more informal discussions around this. Uh, and the other is that, um, so after the breakout groups, we're going to come back together and, and just report out and, and share the highlights from the group breakout groups. So we will ask for volunteers at the start, just, um, for participants who are willing to give that two to three minute report out. We also want to make sure that we're capturing all the feedback accurately. So um, we will also ask for note takers so that we're having participation and things in advance for anyone who's willing to contribute to those tasks. Um, hopefully this um, will feel really participatory and, and just um, create more active discussion. Um, so I think with that, I think we might be ready to jump into breakout groups. And we will come back together in about 45 minutes, maybe a little less. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back from the breakout sessions. Um, I don't know about, we, we had a very exciting session. And uh, now I would like us to go into um, discussions. We'll have two to three minutes, uh, report back from each group. And um, I will leave it open. Uh, any group that wants to jump in with the reports of what came out, highlights. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have you jump in. Yeah, oh, thanks, Barry. Go ahead. No, no worries. Okay, so we principally focused on question four. 
Uh, and that was how can mutual accountability and learning work in practice to support local priorities? Oh, lost. Anyway, um, so it, we had uh, we were quite fortunate to have um, Vincent from the UK government, uh, formerly Bifid FCBO now, um, and he he started he kicked it off by saying, well, basically accountability. There is always going to be tension down the chain. Um, from when working with smaller organisations, that's just the reality of it. Um, however, that can be managed, as, as an example is given of, of Braced, um, they're working with local organisations, they had multi-layer accountability, and there's checks and balances at each of these different layers. But I think a key thing that came out of that was the fact that learning and accountability, one, uh, they, were, they were built into the design of the project and the programme, and it was bringing on stakeholders from an early early uh, juncture. So again, this was built into the design, and it had built in that flexibility as well. So they built in learning spaces uh, whereby they could come together and iteratively learn, and then uh, sort of course correct and recalibrate as needed. Um, one thing that did come out of that, that so that's from a design perspective, from an implementation perspective, the knowledge manager. We came online afterwards and then there was sometimes a bit of sort of confusion between accountability and learning. So I think the, the lesson for that is that the accountability and learning need to be considered at the very beginning, baked into the design and the uh, local stakeholders need to be engaged very, very early on. Um, what else did we have? Uh, the, there was also the, so some other sort of positive examples was uh, the Kenya County Climate Funds, um, in Kenya and some of the lessons from DCF as well. But one of the interesting things that, that came out from the conversation was in terms of before we even start talking about um, MEL and accountability and learning, a precondition for this and for effective MEL is that there needs to be information uh, that is flowing to the local local level. There needs to be knowledge in the first place and local actors need to be um, imparted this knowledge that, that, that so that they know whether the mail is going to be good or not and whether you know learning can be integrated or not and that there does need to be this sort of I guess this baseline of, of knowledge first before you can start start looking at, at mail and where the responsibility for that lies is still a little bit unclear. Um, in terms of again a, a, way, a way in which accountability and learning can work in practices another thing that came up was around the decentralization of mail and, and the accountability component can be quite a difficult one, but there does need to be sort of distributed responsibility for that. So it's not, it, it can't just all fall onto the local actors to do this, that there does need to be, because they're, you know, they're the cold face of where adaptive action needs to take place. So they very much need to, um, you know, be empowered to do that, but it can't be their sole responsibility. So it needs to sort of be, I guess accountability and learning needs to sit at different um, different actors across the chain. Um, I think I'll probably stop there because I'm taking up a bit too much time, but it was a, it was a yeah. good, good conversation. So uh, thank you. Cheers. Many, many, many thanks, Barry. I, I wanted to pick from your thoughts in terms of the incentives. What what come what came out from your group? Well, so again, we were quite fortunate to have. Vincent, because I asked him how, as a as a as a donor with his donor hat on, how you can actually incentivize it. And his because because again, sort of moving away the incentivization of climate finance away from outputs and results and impacts that can actually uh, con conceive of adaptation success as including learning. And I think the idea is that his his response was that learning can stand on its own and as a conceptual adaptation success it is a worthy one but as a short-term result the same as adaptation it's quite nebulous and can be quite difficult to measure it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs an impact indicator but it can be integrated a learning journey can be integrated as a sort of perspective on adaptation success um, but he did acknowledge that there's still some persuasion to be done because there is accountability, the donor accountability to the constituencies. You know, they do have to be seen to begin in the parlance of donors value for money. So, yeah, I think it's maybe just shifting this conception of what success looks like for adaptation. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay, thanks. Thanks, Barry. Um, um, who goes next? Which group wants to go next? Two to three minutes, please. Should I go? Should I go now on, on behalf of group one? Please, Robbie, go ahead. So, so we looked at the first question in, in a bit more detail. Um, and what we looked at was kind of aligning the incentives between uh, three overlapping groups. So donors and funders as, as one group, local level stakeholders as another, and then male practitioners as a, as a kind of group that overlaps those. Um, and we really talked about um, emphasizing um, the shared um, value in and recognizing the shared value in learning as as kind of the, the focal point of the of how we incentivize this. Um, and then we talked about how um, that needs to be built into design um, and planning of male systems, particularly evaluations from the outset. Um, and that perhaps we need to recognize that the value of learning ultimately in terms of better locally led adaptation outcomes so so there is almost um, an accountability value in the learning um, and we had a discussion about what that meant in terms of in changing changing behaviors um, and we felt that um, what we need is kind of to start demonstrating that better um, and then finding platforms that not just produce individual uh, MEL outcomes, but how we share though the value of evaluation um, across those platforms, both in terms of the actual content, the learning, but also in terms of the value of doing MEL slightly differently and demonstrating that that um, is, is valuable and, and, and has a contribution to make. Um, let me just check my notes to see if there's anything else. I'm not sure if I've missed anything. Let me let me pause there and go to some others. Okay, many thanks, Robbie. Um, do um, Kennedy, do you want to go next? Um, yes. So, for uh, question number two um, on on the how we sh how how should MEL be used to combine LLA with uh, a local knowledge with climate science to support LLA um we touched on uh, the fact that uh, 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 knowledge and um, uh, knowledge and, and science uh, in indicators are not quantitative so it, uh, they're complex and it's uh, a bit hard to to capture them as compared to numeric indicators so uh, there's a suggestion on how to code them to be able to understand um, uh, how many or to have uh, ratios of uh, uh, to balance uh, local knowledge and, and, and climate knowledge and incorporate them into mail. Um, we also talked about setting up policies that ensure more representation between the two um, uh, aspects and ensuring gender representation uh, also to uh, ensure all um, uh, everyone is represented. Um, and also the the learning aspect of uh, mail came about where um, it was mentioned that there needs to be more um, uh, feedback or, or learning for, from the monitoring and incorporating that into into um, future um, systems um, we also talked about exchange between um, there's an example from Brak Bangladesh about exchange of um, knowledge between uh, the local local knowledge and scientific knowledge in in the mangrove areas and uh, and also exchange between the submerged and dry areas and we, we um, suggested that to apply also uh, in the context of rural and urban areas uh, um, the rural urban continent. Um, Yes, yeah, so the shared understanding knowledge, and that was all from us. Excellent. Man. Also, sorry, sorry. One one final point uh, was about the issue of trust, whereby um, one of the participants mentioned that uh, 
um, local people sometimes do not share their knowledge because they don't trust the policy makers. So um, we should try to uh, uh, emphasize ways to, to build trust between all actors in, the, um, uh, in male implementation. Mm -hmm. That's it, thank you. Oh, many thanks. Um, Tamara? Yeah, we had um, Ohali from our group is going to report out. Thanks, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we had question three, so the question uh, that focused a bit on, on gender, and I think we addressed more or less the question five a bit as well at the end of the, of the conversation, so I will try to summarize the points um, and please the others join in. Um, about the ways to support gender integration and gender equity, we uh, said that it was important to disaggregate, disaggregate data, uh, for sure, that's uh, kind of obvious, but uh, important to say again, uh, and also to integrate gender specific uh, analysis to complement the climate vulnerability analysis that uh, are generally done um, for local led adaptation and look at uh, important key figures on how uh, gender in inequalities uh, are appearing in the area we are working in. Uh, so it could be about education, etc. Um, we also talked about the importance to have a strategy to reach the most vulnerable, whether women or men or um, other type of vulnerability, and not only gender related, but looking at uh, having an intersectional uh, approach. Uh, and we made the parallel with um, the different studies that have been done on how to reach the ultra poor. Uh, and uh, it's really important to have a strategy to reach, uh, to reach them because they do not turn out uh, generally in community meeting, et cetera. So uh, our male approach needs to be really careful about that. Um, we also talked about the importance about participatory monitoring uh, and embedding that uh, from the start. Um, we discussed in particular tools such as uh, like the most significant changes uh, tool uh, to monitor unintended and intended outcomes. Um, and we also say that it's important that uh, even the decision about what are the outcomes we want to reach uh, need to be in the end of uh, local uh, is it local groups, local authorities, etc. Uh, so I think we didn't say it like that, but sometimes our project uh, monitoring is not the right place uh, to monitor uh, in increasing adaptive capacity or increasing resilience, and sometimes. Uh, having more participatory process uh, really led uh, by communities is really uh, a better way to do that. Um, we also, in terms of approaches or methods, we were also saying that um, we could do like post-disaster uh, analysis evaluation to see how uh, resilience has been built. Um, and so, yes, um, and maybe the additional point on the on same issue was to, um, really not see male only as like log frame, uh, a log frame thing, but really look at a broader approach to use like comparative, comparative approach, uh, outcome mapping, uh, etc. Uh, and also the learning part that also discussed was, uh, is, is quite critical um, in our male approach. Um, Maybe one last point we discussed is the importance of the do no arm. It was not really in the question, uh, but importance of do no arm in our male approach uh, and uh, the data protection and data protection because we are all going into like using technology to gather data about resilience, but uh, sometimes we are not very not enough careful or not very careful uh, about how the data will be used and by who uh, and for what. Uh, so it's really important that we are all conscious um, of this point. Uh, I hope I have not forgotten point. Uh, maybe as a conclusion, uh, one of the participants say that uh, on gender, gender is not neutral and as male. Uh, so really, really we need to, to pay attention to, to the outcome that uh, we are um, because it can really have impacts on the communities we are working with. Excellent, many thanks. And um, do you have a quick highlight what you consider that came from your group uh, about incentives to male to mail that supports local and adaptation? Mm. 
Uh, maybe the one point we said, we said that donor needs to embrace flexibility and adaptive management, but how? We were not really, we did not really discuss the how. Uh, but we are saying that uh, it's important that budgets are a bit more flexible uh, and, and leave space for um, human resources, because you need human resources to, uh, to do good monitoring and evaluation. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very many thanks. Um, so, um, uh, uh, any questions coming from, we have um, some more quick reflections that come from the participants, one or two minutes on that. 